So we've come to the end. <laughs> Combination ish. I'm sure um, I should learn my lesson by now. I, I I plan for a shorter lecture, and I'm pretty sure that I'm still going to run out of uh, time. Um, so I wrote some things beforehand just to save a little bit. So I wanted to just kind of give a bit of a recap of what happened yesterday. Uh, so uh, we were we started discussing uh, this Wilson line, which is defined basically as the path order exponential of a and a bar. And we discussed it from the point of view. Oh, this is still white. Sorry. Um, from the point of view of this uh, path integral representation. Okay, so we introduced this pro view. Uh, we discussed how to construct uh, the associated to it. Uh, we also talked about um, this part here, the representation. So I was using the highest weight uh, uh, representation. And something that I didn't discuss though, so we kind of like left it here. We talked about some aspects of, of the action. Uh, but something that I just wanted to mention, uh, you can look in the, in the 2013 papers and, and follow-ups of it. Um, you can evaluate this action uh, in general for any, um, basically any SLN theory. Um, and in the saddle point, the value basically of this action, what I wrote down here is basically how much the on-shell action is. It has a very... Ah, you were not here yesterday. No, 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 it's fine. Um, not too big. So this action, so I'll just write it for SL2. So I'm writing it in a first order formalism where uh, P is the conjugate variable to, to U. Uh, U transforms under, um, well, this action has a left and a right symmetry under which uh, U transforms like this, and L and R are elements of SL2. Uh, P transforms as R inverse PR. So it's like a right moving uh, momentum. Uh, there's a Lagrange multiplier here, sorry, that enforces that basically the trace of P squared of the conserved quantity is the Casimir. So that's where the data of the representation is going to be contained. So this highest weight representation has a quadratic Casimir uh, C2. Which is 2H times H minus 1. So it's basically like the mass of the, of this particle. And then, um, you can integrate this out, integrate P and U, uh, sorry, P and lambda out. Um, and then this action will look Like this, where um, as this form. Okay. So, in terms of the interpretation of what we're doing with this Wilson line, when you get to this line, it's a bit more clear what's happening. So what's happening here is that uh, if I, if you, in particular, if you set like u equal to one, it becomes uh, quite obvious that basically this is the action of a point particle, where the einbein. You don't even have to set u equal to one. You can just define the einbein 
as basically even with this u transform like this, and then this, then this is just the square root of g mu nu. Uh, and so this basically argues why this Wilson line is in any way related to understanding uh, geodesic uh, distances, understanding kind of um, a little bit the local properties of the theory. And so for this context, um, so well, this is the result is a bit more general. I like to one one reason. So this is very specific to SL2. Uh, this this is not going to generalize for SLN. So the generalization for SLN is that here I would have to add additional. So you will have like one Lagrange multiplier and another. Well, you will have a whole series of Lagrange multipliers where you will be imposing constraints over the trace of Pn and, and demanding that they're equivalent to the appropriate Casimir of that representation. So you will have like a, you will have more terms, okay? Because the representations of SLN have higher order Casimirs and you will have to fix those as well. Um, and so that's why then these rest of these steps don't quite follow. So this is, but it's convenient to write it. That's why it was convenient to write it in this way. So this is relevant for for SLN type theories. So that's why we like to write it like this because it very easily generalizes to SLN, uh, but then this rest of these steps don't follow, okay? It's not so easy to integrate out P and get an action like this. So this geodesic-like property is very particular to SL2, uh, but for other cases, um, it looks more complicated. But in any case, uh, even for the SLN, so anytime you have this action, even with the higher order Casimirs, uh, this is always going to be true. So that's why you can just solve for the equations of motions, and you're going to find that the on-shell action is just this very uh, value. Uh, where here we introduced, um, these are the eigenvalues of a matrix M, where M is given by this combination. So R and L, are basically the the gauge um, group parameters that characterize each of the connections. And uh, UI and UF are basically the values of this field at the endpoints. And what's nice about uh, writing this, uh, the action in, in this way is that from this point of view, it's clear that uh, there's no dependence on the path, regardless of like having this nice geodesic description uh, this makes evident that it didn't matter which way you got from the initial to the final point. The only thing that you need to know about the system is like, okay, what is the value of the connection when it started and when it ended? And it also displays to you the dependence um, at the endpoints on the values of the field. So this is kind of like the gauge dependence that you have. You have to say something about uh, how the this probe is behaving at the endpoints and your result is going to depend a lot on that choice, okay? So if you're interested in, in ADS-3, so for the purpose of doing ADS-3, CFT-2, uh, the choices we made, the ones that kind of gave us nice physical interpretations was to set UI equal to UF and equal to the identity, provided that you were writing down these connections in this radial gauge that we discussed in the first. Okay? So that, that was one of the homeworks is like understanding if you modify the boundary conditions, how would you modify uh, these, these values? Okay? But this is, this is like, we're, we're not deriving this. We're just saying, look, this is, this is a choice that. Um, very good. And here, our P0 is basically, so it is the same P that I'm defining there. Uh, this is an indescribable answer. Here, it's just capturing basically what are the properties of the representation. So, um, the same here was related to this Casimir. So basically, the, if you're just looking at the case of SL2, the action is going to be proportional to H, probably the mass of the, the particle, but then in the higher spin cases, zero can have also other weights associated to the higher spin. Since I think you said yesterday, you, you can also just directly evaluate the path order. Yes, and that's what we're going to do today. So this is just uh, so this way of doing it, this path integral way of doing it. I think it's just convenient to like start getting results like kind of quickly. It's like the anxiety of like okay, what uh, what happens? Uh, it also, uh, as I'll illustrate, it 
give me more intuition about like how to do computations in specific. Um, but just understanding a little bit of the symmetry is one of our requirements. So. so and also like with this, you have no yeah. So today I'm going to get it exactly. I'm not going to break uh squiggle. Um, but I do want to say though that uh, even at this stage, so even with this type of manipulations, um, there's some interesting things to note. So just in terms of results, so for instance, um, in terms of in the holographic project, projects, uh, what was noticed is that it can compute this where the endpoints of the Wilson line are going to the face, so we're imagining here we have the boundary. Um, the interior, so this is the radial direction, and this is the y direction. If you anchor the Wilson line at the boundary, and then you make it go in, whatever shape you want to make it go in, and then it comes back again, so you have some um, initial and final point here. Uh, this quantity uh, at the level of the approximation is basically computing a uh, correlation function of what people will call like two type operators. No, I don't have a description of all the microscopes. No. So this is just like, okay, you, 
I am a direct production of some AGC That's it. What are the microspaces in it? Then there should be a description. What are they? Well, I, I, I said if, if one had a description, then one might be able to do it. Yes. We don't have it. We don't have it. Let me ask one question now. Is this is, 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 should be part independent, right? Because this is a term second step. Yeah, this is this is reflecting what was at the moment. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I wrote like you it didn't matter like yeah, so it doesn't have to fall like a nice do that so like that goes that. No, it doesn't doesn't matter. And and this part of the answer, that's why I like to write down uh, we, we like to write down the answer like this because this clearly illustrates that the only thing that you had to put in was what the initial of five reports of these connections were. You don't even have to solve like I don't even need to know what is the geodesic distance to tell you. Uh, what that object is. And, and yeah, it reflects basically that this like topological. So, so, a question so, this is a light operator, but you're still using a geodesic computer. Yeah, it's, it's all good. It's massive, it's not problem. Good. So, okay. it's massive, more massive than ADS. Yeah, compared to, to the background. It's, 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 it's heavy and ADS, yeah. but it's light and fine. So, it's, uh, so, so, here when I use the. Okay. Yeah, so here when I use light, it's light relative to the central charge of the system. But yeah, the, the, the genetic approximation is heavy relative to the ABS scale. So it is, it is rather than one, but less than zero. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, the, the jargon is, uh, <laughs> is not ideal <laughs> because there's different scales. That, yeah. uh, but okay, and then the second thing that uh, that I just want to make is that you can also, if you do this, uh, if you take the world from the around the five direction, around the uh, spatial direction, um, then this basically gives you. Again, I forgot to. I just noticed when I was here that I forgot to write down this specific. Coefficient, uh, but it will be something like uh, h times the entropy of the black hole, where this entropy is the same formula that I wrote before. This is of minus pi minus the pi bar times L zero, which is not in the SL two case is not surprising, right? Because if you compute the Wilson line around, around that loop, it should measure the size of the horizon. Uh, but okay, this also happens in SLM, and this is ideal. But okay, um, very good. Um, but we're not done. <laughs> so, uh, as you guys have been asking, you want an exact results. Let's not do wiggles, let's not take these limits. Um, so, and there's some things that here are kind of still a bit confusing about our knowledge uh, of transcendence. So, one thing that so we want to compute the, this this Wilson line uh, exactly, and one thing that we want to so so as we as we try to evaluate uh, this this W. Uh, I basically want to understand what are choices of these states that I, I should pick. I should be more specific about what are these UIs and UF. I was kind of like, but what this buys me is that I really, besides saying that I, I wanted the highest weight graph, like that I wanted some Casimir that was a real number, uh, I really didn't think much more about what these states are. So. Basically, the question now is what is the okay. So, and as you start asking this question, um, basically something uh, comes very quickly into mind, and, and that's why this type of results are sort of uh, nice is that um, you want states. Ui and Uf, uh, such that the result, final result uh, doesn't factorize. So in transcendence theory, one of the things that transcendence theory is bad at is it's bad at 
connecting the two copies of a vessel two. So this is our gauge group. And for instance, in the first lecture, uh, we were always like just basically just talking about one copy of vessel two. And it's very tempting to do that. You write down the action, you do the thermodynamics, the classical phase phase. Uh, then all the properties of the equator block holes were basically just kind of okay, I keep track of both, but every condition that I imposed, everything that I said, just looked like one copy of that one. But now, as we're competing this muscle line and we're trying to make connections uh, with um, this type of physics of like, okay, I want to have some notion of how to compute distances, how to compute correlation functions. Uh, I will want something that doesn't treat these two things independently. Right? Something you can extend, right? Exactly. So, so if you look here, so that's why I like to kind of take this route. U is basically something that is connecting both of them. Because it has a left and a right action. And so the basic property that I'm looking in my state is The basic feature is that if I have some group element, so let's say that sometimes I'm going to write down this GL as a T bar. Our inverse, I'm just going to put the G here just to make up this is a group element. Sometimes I'll just write down L and our inverse. But basically, what I want is that I want the actions of the group elements on some state U to be such that it's compatible with that transformation property. Okay? So if I act with group elements or whatever state I'm going to define, it transforms in this like five-fundamental way. Okay? And this should do the trick of like not being uh, living and saying like, oh I just have one cosmic vessel too. Uh, and then I can just talk about it as a two two seven stuff. I want to have something here I want to project the pattern where it's going to look at something that uh, really sort of combines uh, the two of them. It's like the rigid polydynamics is space space and polydynamics. What's that? So I think the rigid polydynamics is space space and polydynamics is symmetries. I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's the theory also. Yeah, it's not like open the right. Uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, 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 this is not, yeah, uh, it's, it's a little bit, um, the, yeah, so it's just something that we have to kind of keep that in, in mind as we're making these connections between assignments and, and gravity. Because the thing that uh, is striking, as I said, like, assignments always makes very evident this topological nature of gravity, but gravity actually does not factorize. So if you want to use transcendence as a tool to study, tell you something about gravity, you can't just be doing things that are always like factorized into two. So that, that's the other, that, the other point. Like, yes, the gauge group factorizes into two, but really gravity, we know, is not a theory that is something like. It's some of the problems. Because boundary conformity theory has a sort of. Some parts of it. So, so, so there's, that's why, like, so, so we, can, we can have this debate. Like, yeah, there's some aspects. For instance, the perturbative states, and that's why when I was describing the classical phase space, they factorize, right? You have like the left and the right. And yeah. Even the right. a sum of products doesn't factorize yeah, unless exactly. there is one dominant piece or something, which is what happens in the. Yeah, this in is this kind of sort of like what's happening for instance here. So then it factorizes. Exactly. So if you can argue that like one primary is like the dominant mm -hmm. contrib contribution, then things start factorizing. But if, like, even when like uh, the Lodi and Witch are trying to break that one's path and triple break, you say, yes, I start with like all the vacuum contribution is this. But then as you, as you try to impose modular variance, it tells you very quickly this thing it does not factorize into two. So like the presence of black holes on the kind of tells you I don't want to factorize. Right. So yeah, but there is something close in a sense, is what I yeah, I mean whatever yeah. sense you want to take that. Yeah, so so that, that's a, it. but this is where we have to kind of be tricky. Yeah, there's some CFT quantities that can be factorized. They also will be factorized if I take the classical limit, yeah. the larger yeah. limit. But then if I if I start taking one of her n effects. But even just the sum sum over mod squares is also It's very specific. Yeah. It's also special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and for the for the torus partition function, yes. Yeah, or 
even for correlators. Uh, no, that's yeah. You can write it as sum of mod squares of this. But but then like the question would be, okay, then as I treat transcendence theory, I should also see that same that's structure. Changed, right? But if I only talk about one correlator right. and two, I'm never going right. to see that structure. So this is like the first time, like even at a classical level, that it's like, okay, we really need to start like thinking about this. Because I'm going to start going trying to explore things in the interior. And the interior of ABS3 does in fact for us. It's just because when I took the limit, the road going to infinity, that I started seeing more of the CIT2 uh, parts. Uh, so this is just, that, that's why we were kind of like interested in this, even though, know, okay, we're going to just be computing like things that are known, but it's like, how do I phrase the thing in the science theory such that the two guys, two copies are forced to talk to each other? How can I implement that? Uh, the moment that the state u uh, lives in some, is a state of a coset theory, is that the... It's a state of a coset theory. The um, DCF, I'll give DCF. you examples and then you can tell me if that, I, I, yeah, representation theory, even though I use it, it's not my brother, but... No, no, this is the, this is the statement, uh, what is the statement on the CFD side? That, like, let, let's let's go through some examples. I'll build these six for you, and then the CFT uh, uh, interpretation will be clear, and then you can you can tell me how should I put like fancy words to it. <laughs> I, I'm always bad. At, I'm, I'm very kind of like equation oriented. <laughs> okay, so so let's build these six. Oh, because, well, uh, why well, erase my list of my If one thing that you can quickly notice is that if you just grab any of the sentence, and if you would have computed the Russell line, like I said, have made the choice, all oh, let me pick UI and you have to be in seven, it clearly, it would have factorized the game. But okay, so, uh, let's build. So there's a nice the way that we approach this. Uh, so uh, in this 2018 paper that I said that the first uh, lecture was the following. So let me introduce uh, an operator. So define operator Q A. Okay, that will depend on some uh, on some group element U in the following way. So let me. Write down the things, and then I'll introduce what representation means. So here, uh, LA and this LA bar are basically uh, elements of the, of the algebra, so this will be the left and the right. And this uh, DAs are basically the coefficients in the add point. So if you have uh, group element acting on the generators, the DAs are just the coefficients. This is the definition of just of the elements of the action. Okay. Uh, so basically, here what I'm saying, this is just a fancy way of saying consider a linear combination of the LAs in it. M is an element of the group. Okay, so Oh yeah, sorry, it has nothing to do with the other M. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an element of the of that sort of, of the it's a group element. Okay. So that's why sometimes that's why I'm putting sometimes the G in front, just to make a difference between the elements of the algebra and the elements of the group. But yeah. So this is a joint action. Yeah. yeah. So that's what, what that's what this is um, it's basically the actual action. So I'm gonna, here this is just, I'm just saying, like, oh, consider some linear combination of these, of these the LAs and LA bars. That's the, the way you have uh, written the indices, it seems like these are the pi prime. But, uh, no, A and A bar, A prime are a joint uh, representation. A joint indices. Okay, and DA, A prime is by a joint? <laughs> it's the adjoint matrix. Yeah. Left is into a right is into. Oh, and yeah, so it's, like it's just, well, it, I'm just showing them, so they're not like really talking to each other right now. 
But I'm going to consider like product representations. But, but it seems like L bar is the generator in the right hand side. Yeah, yeah, this is one of them. Okay, so let's be. Let's call it the uh, WhatsApp. Yeah. So this is a generator. Let's call it WhatsApp. Yeah. And then what? This will do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I have two copies of this one too. Yeah. So so to add, you need to like uh, take the right hand side to see a jibra, add it to the right hand side to see a jibra, then add. Yes, I didn't find the so, so D is something that converts, it's a map from the D algebra of right yeah. to the D algebra yeah. of yeah. I don't know if that's, that's not how it is. D is just a but, uh, adjoint uh, matrix of uh, SL2. Adjoint, you can identify the A and the A prime in some canonical way. What, what is the transformation property of U inside? Uh, oh, here, here, U is just telling you, like, oh, which matrix did you like here? That's how does it transform? Well, I'm going to connect it to, I'm going to connect it to, for now, if you want, this is better to hang, I can have all this. This is just a 3x3 matrix. So you, so you use it by fundamental. No, it's just a 3x3 matrix, it's just a solid matrix. It's just a 3x3 matrix. You, first of all, wasn't by fundamental. No, not yet. It should be a matrix. You use the element of SL2. And uh, you is an yeah, and you transform yeah, this LUR, right? You transform this LUR. Isn't that the same thing? Okay, but, 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 that's what we're going to say. No, no, no. It's very straightforward. It's, 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 it's not going to be identified. There's no, nothing ambiguous about it. It's just an adjunct action of S and 2. That's all. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's a 3 by 3 matrix. You write down that. I, I understand all that. Yeah, but that's all it is. It's just defining it. It's just clear. Yeah, that's, that's all. I mean, it's B is a. And if you SL2, this is the matrix in 3 by 3 matrices yeah. that are part of SL2, and you can define that you are getting L bar to be part of the space of L. No, no, you can canonically identify the, the, the two. The, there are the two SL2s, so and you can just canonically identify them. I don't know. 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 <laughs> well, the, the, the choice of me is going to tell me how I manage to do things. Yeah, that's what I was But But in some sense, the D itself, it just has some information. Right. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. 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 You know what she means. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love this. This is the uh, Okay. <laughs> well, I Wait, what time? Um, oh, it's 10 to 11. Okay. The, okay, so I have still like. Okay, so now, okay, so I define this operator, so this is the definition of Q. So now uh, I'm going to define my state. I'm going to look at basically what are states that annihilate this operator. So since now you guys want to use the notation B, I'm going to define B, so this is the definition. is basically something that annihilates uh, QA. Okay. Now that of course there's traces of QAs that are not there's not going to be any state that annihilates it. But um, let's assume that there's at least some choice of QA for which uh, the solution to this equation is not uh, the empty set. Okay? And so this state B lives uh, basically in the two copies of SO2. So why is this a uh, useful thing? Is because now we can say, well, what happens to be uh, if we act with a group element GL and a group element GR inverse? And so from these definitions that I wrote down here, one thing that it's not difficult to do is that you can see my questions of you. If I act with uh, two group elements, uh, a G and a G bar on QA, um, a little bit of algebra will show you that way to do it again, but Uh, oh, sorry, P and then this will look like B. 
the list of coherence. Where does theta normalize? Oh, there are delta functions. In the sense, like these are the like the boundaries. Yeah. So, so yeah. So there. That's why. Okay. So um, let me see how I do in the time. It's a lot. Of, okay. So um, well, something that's well because of the rotation property of, of these states. So for instance, you can just write. I'll, I'll drop the i and c here just so I don't uh, write so much. Uh, but this is basically the same as this, and then you can rewrite it again, and then say, well, this is the same as having right here. This thing, so basically what I'm doing here, so first I just put everything inside of one state, uh, and then I move that, and then I rewrite this such that there's an action only on just one group. So I just basically said, well, this product here is basically the same as just a product with one of the group elements. So the blue um, thing is e. Sorry, me. <laughs> but I'm looking at it. You guys got me. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so basically, it's, it's, like I'm just using the fact that the states get, uh, get rotated, and then from here it's quite easy. Then you use this explicit form of the states, uh, and it collapses quite quickly. Uh, because then just one of the sums, basically, one of the descendants, as you write it like this, then just one of the descendants is going to, one of the sums is going to collapse, and then this is just a sum uh, of that. And then uh, I can write this. Exactly. So I'm putting in 
So it falls into this controversy class that it's very easy to, to do that computation, just to illustrate that, that it kind of collapses. But okay, we can talk about the other controversy classes and what happens to this product if it doesn't fall into that controversy class. Um, I, I think I still don't know. I, I, the L and R right now. Uh, They're just like whatever I'm just saying. Yeah, but what, what will you be later? I mean, what there will be A and then R. Because you will view this as a back order exponential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. But just from this algebraic point of view, that's what's happening. And then we can generalize this. Like, you can just say one well, then product is only one and two. No, I'm not just confusing that's what they're saying. So, uh, uh, can, can you just please remind me? So, uh, there's, there's some two uh, elements that cannot be turned into minus one, right? If the matrices are not, if this product, it's not diagonalizable. Even diagonalize for that, that it, that it, you can diagonalize it, but it, you can never diagonalize it and put it in this form. But is you right? No, but it always has to be the determinant. No, but these are elements of the cell too, so they always have to have determinant one. Exactly. So, but uh, but you can have them lambda one over lambda, which is one in this thing, or you can have e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta. That's the Elliptic one. Isn't that all uh, fit in this? It's no. With alpha pop x. No, no, well, I don't know. No, because the L0 is a. Uh, it's, it's, there are, it's like time like light like and null vectors. It's, uh, you can't rotate a time like vector to a, a null vector uh, in, uh, in this thing. So, if you. So, in that. Yeah, sense, so, so uh, once you discuss more carefully about this, I'm going to this is another. Yeah. <laughs> discuss it. But just for simplicity, like this is my, like, um, okay. Um, yeah, and so just more generally, like, if you do the inner part of the linear piece states, assuming that the inner part is the class that I'm discussing, uh, then where this alpha is the the inverse of the two. So this is in general, like just what the what this looks like, and this is basically just the character of this one too uh, for for this continuity class. Okay, so So in this matrix M, this is basically the same combination. 
which we started with. And this alpha here is inside is um, or basically a half of the geodesic distance.
And what is the tangent space that you associate? Okay, so let's tell you what the data that connects to this these two uh, components. And so, okay, and it's, if you make the natural choices for A and A bar, then the U that you will want to pick is a cross tab. So that's why the metric formulation, when people try to understand, like basically how to interpret the, red, the scalar fields in, in the language of the CFT, they basically said, oh, if you go to the origin of ADS3, the metric, the, the field should be invariant under rotations at the origin of ADS3. And this is the state that has that feature that it will be invariant under when you would have identified the rotations of ADS3. Now, so given that we have when we write down the usual like connections and the basis that we're familiar with, then the cross map state is the one that will give you the metric interpretation as well. Now I could have been convoluted, I think, uh, and said, no, you know what, I'm going to pick the Shibashi states, but then I'll just pick the A and A bar such that it gives me the the effect of metric that I want. So you, you could have just said, okay, I'm just going to redefine what A bar was. Such that when I act with the Shibashi state, I get the, the genitor that I want to get. So, so this is something that is nice from the true scientist's point of view. Because in the metric formulation, I don't know how to replace this. And so, like, this is where true scientist kind of gives you this extra round of saying, like, making just evident of how you're making choices and how you're picking your bases and how you're connecting uh, things to one another. So, so from this point of view, uh, that you want, um, it's different choices. But okay, if you fix it, if you tell me now you can't like, change what you meant by A and A bar for global radius 3, then the cross cap state is the state that you need to use. Otherwise, you're going to get singular answers. It's not going to be the whole thing. So it's a tangent. It's just that someone in the back can't raise it. Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, just just going to uh, see if I understood right. The uh, inner productivity norm for V1, V2, that is not, uh, that's a more general statement, right? Yeah, this is just a more general statement uh, where I don't have, like, uh, I didn't put in explicitly the group elements here. So I'm just saying, if you have a, any V1 and V2, then you can, it basically follows from here, but this is just a more general statement. Like so it's like the inner product of any of these like, rotated states. Uh, it's going to have that point. Oh, so by this analogy with the vulnerable propagator, can I think of alpha as some distance in between these states in, in some sense? Yeah, in some sense, yeah. And, and that's, uh, it's, uh, it's, yes, telling you something about the distance between the states, yes. So that's why, like, yeah, uh, that, that's roughly what it's doing. So, so, um, so what are these functions then? In the number of these are, uh, these yeah, are so vulnerable is... propagators, they should be giving you some yeah, so let's, let's do that. So let's view this exactly okay. very good. So it's before when we get a hub, suppose we want to do them in black code and not for what we see. What's that? Suppose we want to do the same calculation for a black code. Yeah, we did. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. For only on uh, one moment, because uh, yeah. my, you know, it's, it's, it's tougher. <laughs> well, this, this one is, this you can do for anything. Uh, but then, let, let me, what I'm going to describe now is a bit harder depending on which connection you have. So let, let's do this and basically say, oh, you have some U at some position XI and some U at some position XI. So you can, because you can basically uh, kind of put the group elements inside of the, uh, of the states. And so this is just some overlap uh, between two U's. And so what I'm going to do is depend on both X and X. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I didn't write that down. Yeah, so the group elements. Um, so each of these guys, so for instance, this one. Yeah, so this is like XF to uh, XI inverse. That's a group oh. element. So then so those are the ones that you're moving. Yeah. But yes. here, I also should be uh, careful. So when I make this separation, there could be a middle point, and I have to decide how do I split this. I, I could have inserted here. Uh, and like intermediate point of, so then when I make this separation of what I call uh, U of XI and U of XF, I, this is 
basically the gauge dependence on how I identify like, the field that I'm going to define. But I'm just saying my microchip practice thing and so much needed point. Yes. If you really try to compute the exact multiple propagator for some of these fixed people, like 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 for minimally couples, you know, like uh, six patrick and Kaplan and so on, then you would get connections to this people dependent. Yeah, on so and this is this is contrasting the one. That's right. So this is not really giving you the multiple propagator. Possibly. But that's my reaction of the vector. Yes, but here you didn't exact one to calculation in the general. No, I haven't done an exact one computation because that's not back It's not the comeback reaction. So for that I would need to compute, like, the Wilson line is an operator. This is still the first one test in the future measure. But the line is still a broken in the... In, in, in the and then certain number. Is this the very fine thing you do with the gen cycle state, right? When you go, when well, you I'm just grabbing, like, one classical. It's a saddle point with respect to this half triple with respect to A. But that's, as you discussed, because in the gen cycle state, there's a state, and you're computing the expectation of some of in that state. So that's but it's a classical state. So I'm, I'm not, like, what I should be doing on this is one of my okay. future questions is like, how do I treat the quantum part here? But if you try to write down some big function as a classical state, there's no reason why you get the same kinds of connections with respect to G Newton as you did in That's, yes, and that's why I would like to do that, that type of correction. You think you might get the same connections? I don't know, because uh, the corrections, so there are, there are quantum <coughs> corrections that have been done by, like, uh, uh, Eric Krauss and his collaborators in, in quantum corrections with respect to this true sinus formulation, but they do it just for one copy. They factorize it. Um, that, that's basically saying that you take the states and you write them as wave functions. So as, as no, no, no. Okay, so basically, yeah, they, what they're doing, so they don't talk about the two copies at the same time. They use the factorize. They're just saying, what do you mean, a Wilson line for just one copy of A? And then they basically trade. The quantization is treating A as an operator. And so that, there's also papers like Fitzpatrick and Kaplan collaborators that they also did this, uh, but only for one copy of SL2. And from there, what they're basically reading are formal uh, anomalous dimensions of the, uh, the weights. So, so basically, as you, as you quantize A, uh, H uh, gets corrections um, because of the exchange of gravitons. But I'm not sure, there's a metric. So, then this Patrick and Kaplan, they computed the Wittgen diagram for this guy. And then this gets corrections. Yeah, I mean, they did a slightly different. Yeah, so it's basically just saying like. Yeah, so you start by something else like. Yeah. And that, I will get corrections here. Like, if I treat A as an operator, uh, I will get corrections to that. But I, it's, because I have these two copies and there's this issue, what you say, exploiting on that. How they set up the computations, it, I'm getting a bit confused. Because also, um, when you factorize, the other thing that gets removed very quickly is that the radial dependence you can just ignore. It gets washed away. The radial, this DLR that I was writing down, you look at just one copy, it gets washed away, and then it's an immediate work of boundary computation. Here, the radio part is kind of like sticking around, and then I get confused on how to deal with the radio part, and what have, do I treat that as something quantum, or do I treat it as something classic? Uh, so it's just like that. Okay. I, I, um, okay. we're, we're thinking about it. It's, 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 yeah. I, I don't find it super straightforward, but. Okay, so, so one thing that we can do here. So this is the part that is more tedious and difficult than the point we needed it for aesthetic. What you see is then say, okay, let's view it like this, and then the zero of x. Uh, I'm going to decompose it in a way that will look like this, basically. I'm just going to go back to that uh, to that form. And so I want to view it as a sum over k and k bar, the sum coefficient. Order 
based on their on the properties of the Wilson line itself, you can break the ratio. But this is basically your scalar field, just a the quite order equation. Where this Laplacian is a given Laplacian, you can take it by this um, effective uh, metric. And so from here uh, is where you can also notice what is the difference between these two states. So we built these wave functions. So for global wave, yes, they're basically just the normalizable wave functions, like what we call like the quasi-normal modes. For BTC, they're also they're quasi-normal modes as well, but in a very strange basis. Uh, but it, it gets they're not the usual quasi-normal modes. I can yeah, you know, bring that up later, but I think basically now I have a, a sharp cutoff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but this is basically the so did, did you say it was global ABS for the case of uh, the, the metric, the effective metric? I mean, Spencer was asking earlier also about the, the thing. Yeah, the, the thing you said in some cases it was effectively global ABS, like the cross gap case. That was well, for the for the cross, like okay, for uh, for global ABS. Um, if you put here A and A bar to global A, yes, in both in all cases, the cross cap state kind of follows very quickly. Well, so I will write down A and A bar in the usual way that we write them, and then the cross cap state is what gives me the usual motion of metric. Because when you said about about the boundary property, then this geodesic. Yeah, it's, it's all in this like a, a it's in this metric. Yeah, so and but it would be the regular written about the boundary property so only for the global yeah. ideas. So basically, what happens with the cross cap? Uh, for at least for global ABS, it doesn't, it's not the case for BTC, but for global ABS, so if I do this in global ABS, the difference between the two choices, uh, so for the cross cap, it basically tells you that uh, anytime you wrote down x, x plus, you can switch it to x minus. That's what the cross cap thing is doing here. It kind of like flips the role of x plus and x minus. So it imposes like parity in that way. But if you then the Ishibachi state, the problem is that it's like x plus. I, I might have this part around, but like roughly the difference is something like that. It gives you like a minus sign, and this is because of like these minus signs that are here and here. So, so then that's why the Ishibachi state starts getting me something confusing because it's telling me how to identify left and right in a different way. So, it, it's a new it's, it's how you can impose these boundary conditions. Like, well, from the point of view of the CFT, these are like boundary conditions where you're imposing them. So, but yeah, but I should uh, uh, finish. Um, I had some, there's a lot to be done here. So, we only did it for SL2. This is a construction, we only did it for SL2. Uh, it should be done for the higher spin case. And then understand what is this in the higher spin context. I think that would be very interesting because we don't have like this. Uh, well, it will be interesting when it replaces this box box propagator. Um, and I don't know, also junctions are kind of fun. I haven't talked about um, junctions at all. So just see how the postal lines kind of form a vertex. And then we can discuss three point functions and other kind of stuff that we want to about the locality and the modern directions was the other. So yeah, here A has to be treated classically. Like I said, we have to contest. Okay, I'm done.